So welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. You know, I'm really excited to introduce you today to this week's guest. He's a best-selling author. He's a podcaster of incredible renown. He's a nutrition expert, so that's why he's here, with an amazing backstory, and we're going to get into that. So, Sean Stevenson. It's really easy to remember because his last name is like my first name, with a V. Welcome to the podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Hey, and this is actually our second time together, but the first on my podcast. So That's welcome. Right. And I'm excited. And thank you for having me on your podcast in oh, the past. It was straight fire. It was incredible. We had fun. So uh, we're going to talk about what helped you, you know, get through. I want some of your backstory with degenerative disc disease. And I think that's really important as a place to start because, as you and I both know, there are millions and millions and millions and millions of Americans who are dealing with back pain yeah. and degenerative disc disease. And take me through what happened to you as a young man. Let's start there. Yeah, this is literally a backstory. You know? <laughs> I was um, 20 years old when I got this diagnosis. What sent me in to see my physician at the time was I was experiencing this leg pain that become a bit of a nuisance. And I thought, you know, I, I was so disconnected from how the body worked. I thought maybe I pulled a muscle or something. And once my physician checked me out, he had me go get an MRI of my spine. And I was just like, what is he thinking? My leg hurts, not my back. And we came into the office to look at my scan. He put it up for me to see. And he told me, look, this is, we found the problem. And I'm just like, okay, what do we do? Let's fix this. And he was basically like, no, slow down, son. I gotta explain something to you. And he points at the MRI and he shows me that I have this degenerative disc disease. And he also knew that my bone density was very low as well. And um, I knew that prior to because I broke my hip at track practice. No trauma, just from running. I broke my hip when I was 16. But I didn't get this diagnosis until I was 20 years old. And so I basically, uh, he told me that, that, that I had the spine of an 80-year-old man when I was just 20. So in a sense, I was a very old man inside of a young person's shell, in a sense, because I looked fit, mm -hmm. you know, which, yeah. as you know, there's a big difference between fitness and health. And again, I was very uh, still optimistic because I just wanted to take care of the problem. I was used to working with my coaches, you know, in And sports. you're a college student. Yeah, I was in college at the time. And he told me that, uh, basically he told me to pump my brakes and slow down a little bit because he wanted to explain to me that this is something that is incurable. You know, this is a condition that there is not a treatment for. And he told me lovingly, I guess, that this is something you're just going to have to deal with. And I'm sorry. And it was very heartbreaking for me because he was telling me that I have this condition. He gave me this diagnosis and that there was nothing I can do about it. And I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life in this very strange pain. And I know a lot of listeners know about this. We've mentioned this briefly on my show with you the power of the placebo effect. And placebos, a lot of people don't realize this, they're about 33% effective on average in clinical trials. Yeah. So a fake drug, a fake surgery, fake treatment, the person believing that they're taking the drug that will lower their blood pressure or kill their cancer, for example, proceeds to do just that based Correct. on the power of the mind, about 33% effective on average. And this is why the gold standard of clinical trials, we have to do a double blind placebo controlled because placebos work. Now, he didn't give me a placebo. He gave me a nocebo. This is the opposite. This is a negative injunction from an authority figure. Uh, basically, you know, this is when you hear, you'll never walk again. You know, you have six weeks to live. You know, this is incurable. And every cell in my body believed that. And so over the course of about six weeks, I went from a nuisance of a pain to like chronic debilitating pain. And it just began to destroy my life. Um, for the next two, two and a half years, and by the way, if you ever get a bill of bad news like this, get a second and, and or third opinion, which I did, but it was the same thing. I proceeded to um, really break down mentally and physically. You know, I'd gained a lot of weight because, you know, he's just telling me, be careful, don't do anything. So he gave me permission slip to not be active, which a lot of people want. You That's know? right. So I was just like, thank you. And uh, I sat there on my little college love seat and played a lot of video games and ate what I affectionately call the tough diet, typical university food. Uh -huh. And I, I gained about 50 pounds over that two and a half years. And I was more the thinner person in my family, but my fat gene, it, it flipped on, all right? <laughs> so I was, became very, very fluffy. And 
What was so tragic about this is that I didn't realize at the time, nor did my physicians inform me that not only is my spine going to atrophy, but now everything else is because yeah. our bodies really do work on a use it or lose it basis. And this two and a half years went by and I became, and I, just to give people a reference point, you know, on a scale of one to 10, like one, you have no pain, 10 is the worst unimaginably pain you can experience. I would get this sciatic pain that would shoot down my leg that would be a split second that was a level 10, like bring me down to my knees. And it put me in fear, like literally fear of standing up. Mm -hmm. And so I stood up as little as I possibly could. Fast forward, obviously there's a, you know, spoiler alert, there's a good ending to this, but it took about two and a half years and we were just talking about this before the show. And I think that everybody, it's so important to have exposure. And we really become what we are exposed to. And I had a great environment coming up in my, in my grandmother's household. And she was pestering me, you know, through this period, always calling, check on me. She knew I wasn't well, but I wouldn't tell. I just, you know, you're annoyed by your grandparents and your parents at a certain point, especially in college. In like, college, yeah. You know, I'm fine, but I wasn't fine, you know. And I really realized, like, she instilled in me this notion that I was special, and that I was gonna do something really amazing with my life. And here I was on all these medications, you know, prescription and over the counter. One of them was Celebrex. Ooh. Which one of the side effects, which later, because it didn't have a name yet, was the restless leg syndrome, which I had from taking the Celebrex. Felt my, like my legs were gonna get up and leave me at night. Um, and my life, you know, I was definitely depressed, I was overweight, and I was really lacking a sense of purpose. And I realized that I had an opportunity in front of me and a choice to make, which most people never actually do this, Dr. Gundry. It's more like wishful thinking, right? When they wanna get healthy, it's like, I'll, I'll try, you know, we'll see what happens. I wish this will work, we'll give it a shot. But when you really make a decision about something, right, a true decision, even the word decision is from the Latin day, meaning from, and kaidir, which means to cut. Yeah. You cut away the possibility of anything else but the decision that you make. And so I decided no matter what, I was going to get healthy. And let me stop you there, right there for a second, because in my office, in my exam room, I've got not only a big poster of Yoda, but also several Yoda dolls. And one of our mottos is try not, do yes. or do not, there is no try. And that's exactly right. And so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. channeled that, you know. And what was so fascinating for me in that time period and just experiencing that. And by the way, I'm a very analytical person by nature, I feel. And so it wasn't as if I make this decision and, you know, the clouds parted and everything just got better. <laughs> but I put a plan together, you know, and that plan entailed three specific things. And those three things, just to rattle them off really quickly, number one was when I first went to college, I went pre-med, even though I actually hate, I hated science, like literally <laughs> A couple years ago, I was having still nightmares about biology class yeah. from high school, which is my deep passion now. I love it so much, but I just couldn't stand it. Then I just didn't, it didn't make any, it wasn't visceral. It didn't connect. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was in, in college, I started to see the upperclassmen because you're taught pathology and disease. It's basically the study of disease. Correct. You're not taught health. No. Nope. And so they were like always, you know, um, giving themselves diagnosis with problems, you know, it's just, it really creeped me out. So I got out of that because of, you know, I went, did the pre-med thing because I thought I should be a doctor just because it's just a thing, you know, but I didn't have any exposure except for television, you know? And so the other exposure was a movie, uh, Boomerang from Eddie Murphy. I don't oh, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and he was in marketing. So I was like, I'll do that. That looks cool. And so I got out of that and now life had other plans for me really. And it circled me back to I decided, you know what? I saw the study of disease already. I'm gonna study everything I can about what it takes to be a healthy, sovereign human being. And so for me, the kind of low-hanging fruit was movement. You know, I'd stop moving and being an athlete who was like, I ran a four five forty when I was 15 years old, but then proceeded of course to break my hip eventually and spoil those plans. But that was my connection to health somewhat, but definitely to fitness. And so I began to just move my body again. And it was difficult even just walking. So I started off on a stationary bike and progressed to doing some walking, eventually pick up the weights again. The other thing was I asked this really fundamental question. My spine is breaking down. My discs are degenerating. What are my discs made of? 
what are what is my bones made of? If mm-hmm. my bones are breaking down, my bone density so low, all I knew was calcium from commercials. And come to find out there were dozens of other things, many of them more important than calcium, but they just didn't have a good marketing team, right? And so vitamin K2, silica, you know, sulfur bearing amino acids, all this stuff I'd never heard of. And I was just fascinated. And I decided like, let me get as many of these nutrients in to give my body the raw materials it needs to do the job. How can it do the job without the, the raw materials? Basic stuff. Third thing, if you're not sleeping, you're not healing. And my biggest struggle through that two and a half years was sleeping at night because the pain would wake me up. Literally, if I just changed positions, I'd get that electric shot down my leg. And so I would take a cocktail, you know, I had my over-the-counter and my prescription medication and knock me out, which was really just a pseudo sleep because I woke up in a fog every day that lasted several hours. And once I did change some things I was doing during the day, it changed my sleep at night and I got better very quickly. So to put a bow on this, it was about six, seven weeks later, I lost about 20 pounds, which results not typical. You know, again, being the thin guy in my family, like the weight just fell off of me once I started making these changes. The pain I've been experiencing for two and a half years, every day of my life was gone. And it was about nine months later, I got a scan done and my two ruptured discs had retracted Mm -hmm. and the juiciness, the suppleness of my disc, basically my disc had regenerated. And you could see the light shining through me again. And my physician at the time, he told me that I'd never seen anything like this. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I fired him. And, Good. Um, you know, from there, really, the rest is history because people started to ask me, how did I make this transformation? My professors at school, fellow students, faculty, and they all became my first clients. And I shifted all my coursework over to health and biology and kinesiology and opened my practice. And here I am today. And there you are. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, it's interesting. My uh, And let's get back to your osteoporosis. My my wife, Penny, uh, was an impressive marathon runner. She finished and qualified for the 100th running of the Boston Marathon. And she had osteoporosis. And mm. it's like, how is that possible? You know, you're, you're pounding the pavement and using your muscles, and that's impossible. Well, one of the things that I've written about in, in all my books is that 10% of chickens, factory farm chickens, are killed because of lameness. And there's actually some very good evidence, at least in my opinion, that the lectins in the corn and the grains and the soybeans that they're, fe- that they're fed are one of the causes of osteoporosis. So when I started my health journey, I mean, we had her running with weights, you know, strapped to her yeah. back. And when we changed her diet, which was a very, very heavily carb-based runner's diet, you yeah. know, she she'd come home and eat you know four bags of Doritos, uh, carb loading, just loading. carb loading. <laughs> and when we took that away from her, uh, she doesn't have osteoporosis anymore. So mm-hmm. I'm fascinated with your story because you were eating a college diet, yeah. which is you know pizza, yeah, is poison. <laughs> Great of, poison, but... Yeah, lots of pizza, lots of Hawaiian punch. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> so so you, you brought up sleep, and we've, you know, we've talked off camera about sleep, and you and I have a, a fellow friend, Ariana Huffington, and she's devoted to sleep. So tell me, you know, your, your brand is Sleep Smarter. So yeah. uh, how, how in the ding-dong did that come <laughs> about as your brand, and, yeah. and how do we sleep smarter? Yeah, you know, as you know, when you no longer have a problem, you don't think about it much. That's when you really know you're healed. And so once I got my sleep dialed in personally, even though in my clinical work that, you know, this was 10 years later, I didn't think about sleep anymore. And so I was working with clients and uh, working with patients along with their physicians. And we had incredible success, you know, with helping people to get off, you know, the center pills for their blood pressure, metformins, and things like that for... Uh, various issues, obesity, obviously we dealt with a lot. And it always bothered me that percentage of people that weren't getting well, even though they were making the dietary changes, the exercise changes. And it took about five years in practice before I had the audacity to ask people about their sleep. Mm. And when I did, like I had to hold my chin up because it would just been on my desk hearing these stories from people about their struggles with sleep. And so I dove into the research, and and as you know, there's people want change, but they don't want to change that much. 
And so I was looking for what are some clinically proven tactics that I can get people to employ to improve their sleep quality without turning their lives upside down. And so I implemented with a few patients and one of them, you know, blood sugars 200, 300, just like how are you walking around? And already on metformin, about to go on insulin. And finally, after five years of struggle, she was working with me for about six months, everything normalized. Once we got her sleep dialed in, and I was just like, this is very strange. And then I'd see it with a person who's been struggling with their weight, you know, trying to get the same 20 pounds off, you know, high blood pressure, hypertension. And I was just like, there's something very, very strange going on here. And it has a lot to do with sleep. And so it's basically like the floodgates would open and the things people have been struggling with were now uh, being healed in a sense. And so seeing this firsthand, I was just like, this is the missing piece. There are so many books out there, so many experts out talking about their diet and this is the way and the exercise program, but nobody was talking about this, like a master class, like, and also the, con the connection because just to be honest, sleep is not a sexy topic. You know, if you really think about it. It puts me right to sleep. No. <laughs> <laughs> but if you see, you know, the next new exercise program, it's very sexy. Like, oh, I need to do that. Plus, you know that I'm doing something. So in, in our psychology as humans, today, we think that we have to do something in order to get something. Sure. Which is kind of dangerous. But with sleep, you do nothing and you get all of these benefits, of course, that we'll talk about. And for us to wrap our minds around this, this today when it's just like, I'll sleep when I'm dead you know, sleep is for the weak and all of these things and understanding that this is one of the biggest epigenetic triggers. Literally, we got research showing that of everything that can affect your telomere length, right? So the telomeres are these uh, kind of end casings on the tips of your chromosomes. Correct. This is the greatest biological marker we have of how long you're gonna live. This might be the fastest thing to burn away those telomeres is being sleep deprived. So it's affecting our longevity, it's affecting our ability, you know, our blood sugar, our brain function, also our body composition, which we've got to talk about. Correct. And all from the sleep that you're getting, or better yet, the quality of sleep that you're getting. Because my book is called Sleep Smarter, Not Necessarily Sleep More. I think I think we need to do a video, sleeper size. I, I can... Oh, I like it. I, I like it. You know, we, we can make it hip. <laughs> <laughs> Put some leotards on, yeah, you know, and you go know, to bed. And go to bed. <laughs> and just, you know, nah. <laughs> all right. So... Um, so what, tell me how you take person and figure out, uh, that they're not sleeping or that sleep was the, the problem here. Mm. And I'll tell you some of my experience from coming from a different angle. So you've got these people who are diabetics. Did you, did you first say, well, I'll do the clinical diagnosis. You got sleep apnea. You know, mm. all I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a CPAP and yeah. presto change. Oh, it'll be fine. Yeah. which is the traditional yeah. treatment of all this. What say you? <laughs> you know, it's still, uh, CPAP is just like a medication. You know, a lot of times it's masking a symptom. We can help you to maintain a certain level of health, but we're not taking care of the underlying problem. So a lot of folks that, you know, again, this is something that we use just as a bridge sometimes, mm -hmm, exactly. you know, uh, but we need to address the underlying cause. And for a lot of folks, even if they're thinner, they still have a very high body fat. Right, so carrying too much weight around in your face, frame, specifically body fat, visceral fat, visceral fat, yeah. can affect your ability to sleep and to breathe at night. You know, so that's what we really need to target. But ironically, it's incredibly difficult to lose weight when you're not getting sleep. Correct. And so that's what made it a catch twenty two and very difficult for folks. And so, so get get into the nerdy science. Why is yeah. it difficult to lose weight uh, when you don't sleep? This was a really great study, and there's so many now, but University of Chicago wanted to find out specifically this question, how does your sleep impact your body fat? Not weight, your body fat. And so they took test subjects and they put them on a calorie restricted diet, which is what I was taught in a conventional setting university, which doesn't necessarily work, but they put them on this calorie restricted diet and they sleep deprived them, all right? They allowed them to get five and a half hours of sleep. You know, again, Calorie restricted diet, sleep deprived. Another phase of the study, they take the same people, their same amount of calorie restriction, they're not cutting away any more calories, they're not exercising any longer, any harder, they simply allow them to get eight and a half hours of sleep now. At the end of the study, they compiled all the data and they found that when folks were getting adequate sleep, they lost 55% more body fat just from sleeping 
all right? That's a huge amount. You got to like do uh, insanity, you know, asylum or whatever, like these crazy, and I know Shanti is a good friend, but you got to like really kick your, your own butt to get that kind of result, but you can get that from sleeping more. And so my question immediately, immediately is how? How is that possible? And there's a couple of things. And the real underlying thing is hormones, all right? So yep. number one, when you're sleeping, especially during, and we talked about this a little bit, deep delta wave sleep, because let's, let's just put this out here. When we're talking about sleep, what is it? It's a very strange phenomenon. How do we know that you're sleeping is changes in your brain waves, right? right. And we need to send, spend a certain amount of time in each of those stages to sufficiently heal your brain and body. That's what really it is all about. And so deep delta sleep, this is known as anabolic sleep. This is when you're producing the vast majority of human growth hormone. As adults, especially, you know, kids have a ton of it. Right. And this is why they're always running around, so much energy. And, but it's also muscle promoting and muscle sparing, which muscle is your body's fat burning machinery. It's very expensive to carry. And so you get this huge burst of this human growth hormone, which helps with this burning of body fat, potentially. That's number one. Number two, melatonin itself. All right, so we've got a study published in the International, uh, International Journal of Obesity, and they found that when folks were getting adequate amounts of production of melatonin, they were producing more, more mobilization of something called brown adipose tissue, all right, or BAT. This is a type of fat that burns fat. Oh, I love it. When we think about burning fat, we, we're thinking about the white adipose tissue. That's right. the stuff we're trying to get rid of. Brown adipose tissue, the reason it's brown, by the way, is that it's so dense so concentrated in mitochondria, right? right. And this is stuff that we talk exactly about. Right. It's just so amazing. And you increase your body's production and mobilization of that brown adipose tissue when you're producing melatonin via being in darkness and getting taking your butt to sleep. I'll share one more, so many. But on the other side, one of the first things that we see clinically when somebody's sleep deprived is an increase in cortisol, right? This glorified stress hormone that's not a bad guy. It's important for True. thyroid function. I mean, just on and on and on. But if it's produced in the wrong amounts and at the wrong times, it can be very problematic. And so we would see people come in, we call them tired and wired, right? So they have a very difficult time getting out of bed in the morning because cortisol is too low. And at night, they're just up. They're wired because cortisol is elevated in the evening. And so folks in this study, by them getting more sleep, they're gonna have a tendency to get better sleep just by the act of you know getting in the bed and having that whole process. And so cortisol is gonna come down. And the issue, how is that tied to fat loss, is cortisol has this very interesting ability to break your valuable muscle tissue down when you feel stressed, because that's an ultimate stressor is when you're sleep deprived to your body. It can break your muscle tissue down. It's a process called gluconeogenesis and yep. turn your muscle into fuel, basically Correct. as a survival mechanism. So you're losing the thing that's helping you to burn fat whether you're active or not. And the list goes on and on. I could talk about another 10 hormones, but that's really how powerful it is for affecting our body composition. I can see I can see another video. Sleep yourself thin. There it is. We there, get, we're doing a series. Yeah, we're doing We're, we're going to be, you know, leotards in the bed. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, so, so in other words, I might... Are you telling me, uh, Penny, if you're listening, my wife... So I don't have to do the spin class at 5.30 in the morning, uh, three days a week. I could sleep through the spin class and, and do better? Uh, I'm not giving you the permission <laughs> slip. I'm not getting involved. No, I'm going to do my spin class. <laughs> okay, so you've got this, you've got this human being. Um, how do you get them to sleep? They're on three medications. Yeah. I mean... Just give us a little tease. What, what, what's the first step? Sure, sure. Um, I always, and this is for anybody who's a coach or a physician or, you know, a chiropractor, anybody who's in the wellness space, and just coaching in general, the most important thing to do is to connect and listen to the person. They often tell you the cause and cure of their problem if you let them talk. Absolutely true. And looking for that leverage point for people. So I look, I've got all of these strategies. Let me find out the thing that's going to fit best with them. And so for one patient, for example, they might be, you know, they're exercising, they're eating well, but they're exercising at, after work, right? And so they're after work, you know, they're doing a nine to five, they're in the gym at six to seven, 7.30, and they're trying to get to bed by 10. 
And this could be throwing their whole circadian rhythm upside down. Yep. You know, again, some folks, I'm not saying to not exercise, but this might be that thing. And Appalachian State University did a study and they tested to find out they had folks trained exclusively at 7 a.m., then at 1 p.m., then at 7 p.m. at different phases of the study. They compiled all the data, morning exercisers spend more time in the deepest, most anabolic stage of sleep. They tended to sleep longer. They had more efficient sleep cycles, which this is what sleep is really about. And, which is kind of overlooked sometimes, these tests, when they were doing that phase, had a 25% greater drop in blood pressure at night as well, which is kind of correlated with the activation of that parasympathetic rest and digest. So, what I want you to do, you know, if I was working with somebody who, and that's their story, I would try to work with them to restructure their life because a lot of times they have that story of like, you know, I can't work out in the morning or whatever the case might be. And so to help them restructure things, to try, let's do maybe a shorter workout instead of you going to the gym for an hour, let's do a 20 minute, very uh, intelligently constructed, highly effective, and I give them the research, like do this thing for just 20 minutes in the morning. And then you're gonna get all these benefits of sleeping better at night because you're elevating cortisol, your core body temperature is gonna be elevated for several hours afterwards. And so that's one strategy is for folks to simply exercise in the morning, if at all possible. And even if they are exercising in the afternoon, still do some in the morning because it does something that we call a cortisol reset. It gets that cortisol elevated so it can get back on a normal pattern potentially. So that's one simple tactic. All right, so what you're saying, Penny, you're right. I got to go spin at 5.30 in the morning. You're so brilliant. You know, I love you. So thank you very much. No, I think you're right. One of the things that we really do try to do in my practice is get people, if they're going to exercise, to do it in the morning. Yeah. Um, now, I see, I, I see a number of people who have sleep issues, and they do have a high cortisol level. And one of the things that I found miraculous, and I actually told uh, Dr. Oz this uh, off camera, uh, who's a friend of mine, and I said, you know, a, a supplement called Relora, which is basically magnolia bark extract and an Ayurvedic herb called philodendron, is miraculous in lowering cortisol levels. And mm -hmm. it's known as a, as a sleep aid. And I've studied thousand patients with elevated cortisol and relora works i would say for 95 percent of them in lowering mm -hmm. lowering cortisol and i so i told dr oz that it's 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 a miracle and then i said oh geez i should have never told you that because now, right. now, now you're going to be in front of congress right you're going to be back in court <laughs> <laughs> any yeah. any have you ever tried relora? oh my goodness listen this is really a great pivot to one of the biggest and I love this because we talked about this together for your new book. And, and basically, it's fix your gut to fix your sleep. And also, the things that are going into your body, it's going to have a huge impact on your sleep quality. And so one of the things that I talk about is uh, eating plenty of good sleep nutrients. Yeah. And so what does that look like? Um, something as simple as vitamin C. So there was a, a study that was published in the Public Library of Science. And so what they found was that folks who were deficient in vitamin C had a tendency towards waking up more frequently at night. And once they fixed this deficiency, they began to sleep normally, all right? A simple deficiency like that. And you would think I'm getting plenty of vitamin C from my you know, pasteurized orange juice. <laughs> no, there are many different forms also of vitamin C and also the bioavailability of that and also your gut bugs, right? Your, your gut buddies, as you call them, yeah. and how it is interacting. Is this actually going to be able to get fed to your cells? at the end of the day, you know? So the quality, and I love not just what is like a good source, but like what's the best thing? Like the top two to three things. For vitamin C, there's um, camu camu berry. Mm -hmm. yep. amla, amla berry, there's acerola cherry. These are super like, we're talking about 50 times more vitamin C than like lemons or something like right. that. And so you can look into stuff like that or just foods that are in your local area that are growing in season as well. You're going to find in some surprising sources as well, you know. Um, different teas even have good sources of vitamin C. It's not that hard to come by, but we have to understand it's an antioxidant. So it kind of gets used a lot by the body. That's one of the things. Another one is magnesium. This is huge. Huge, especially Absolutely. for Glad sleep. you brought that up. Now, what we were seeing was somewhere around 70 to 80% of people being deficient in magnesium. The testing is, to be honest, is still a little, I don't think we've got it dialed in yet. Correct. But the seeing people addressing this and, and increasing their magnesium levels, 
amazing. So here's why. Magnesium is responsible for about 325 biochemical processes we know about, right? Many of them related to muscle function, brain function, uh, sleep. And so one study, this was done on folks that have clinical insomnia. And they were seeing like 100% of them were deficient in magnesium, getting their levels optimized. We're seeing about 70 to 80% of those folks, you know, ironically, uh, having their sleep issues subside just from that one thing. Now, the issue is this. First, food first, very big advocate of that. Any food that's green is going to be a good source of magnesium. But I think more than any other mineral, so I said nutrient deficiency, let me say mineral deficiency. More than any other mineral, this one gets zapped because it's kind of an anti-stress mineral. It deals with a lot of stress responses. Absolutely true. And we are in a hyper-stressed environment. We just are. You know, even though we're inside of a building, we're like we're smelling, you know, processed air, whatever, you know. And today our lifestyle is very different. So we're dealing with a lot of stress. That's why it can get zapped from your body. Eat plenty of magnesium-rich foods. Supplementation, oral supplementation is good. You just need to be careful because of something called bile tolerance. If you take even a little bit more than your body can absorb at the time, it's going to pull water to your bowels and cause what we call uh, clinically disaster pants. All right, you poop in your pants. Milk of magnesia right? is concentrated magnesium. And there's That's so many different how it forms. Works. You know, there's citrate. There's even uh, Epsom salt. Right? Epsom so salt is magnesium. magnesium yeah. You know, and so I love topical. I love topical because your body absorbs basically the amount that it, it can use. I feel that. It doesn't do everything that an oral magnesium or a food does, but I think it's a great option for folks. So fix your gut to fix your sleep. Um, one other thing I want to share really quickly on the gut buddy front is it was Caltech researchers. They found, and you already know this, that there are certain microbes in our gut that communicate with cells that produce sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters. Correct. So these microbes, this friendly flora, this cascade of, of bugs, these are gut buddies, are responsible for producing sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters, one of them being serotonin. And serotonin is found more in your gut than anywhere else, as is melatonin. Yeah. So melatonin, and this, I, I literally wanted to scream it from, you know, the balcony when I found this out. In school, I was taught melatonin is produced by the pineal gland End of story. Yeah. You can actually remove the pineal, pineal gland and your levels of melatonin will stay relatively the same in your gut. And so you have about 400 times more melatonin in your gut than in your pineal gland. And this goes to, goes to show us serotonin is a precursor to melatonin. Yep. Melatonin itself is produced there. And this all has to do with this environment. So we need to take care of this environment, you know, by supporting, obviously, the friendly flora, getting rid of the things that cause the bad guys to take hold yep. of our ship. Support them with you know prebiotics, and eat plenty of good sleep nutrients. Very good, very good. So, um, you know, you talked about when you were learning about nutrition, the, the prevailing idea was calories in, calories out. Mm -hmm. um, you probably hear it from all the time from people all the time saying. You know, that's still the truth, and how dare you question the conventional wisdom that is the truth. What, what, do, you, what do you say to that? I mean, at this point, and there, there are even some of my friends who are fantastic uh, physicians and healthcare practitioners are really advocating that. You know, just like, you just, you got to cut the calories. You know, why, what are you complaining about? And it's not understanding, you know, even, let's, let's just take ourselves as an example, not just your friend who can eat the same diet as you, but not gain weight. And then you even smell a donut and your butt starts jiggling, like okay. extra, right? Leotards, program, <laughs> okay. never mind. All right, so here's the thing. When you were younger, right, maybe in your, teen, you, you know, in your teens, you could you know, eat the pizza and the exactly. ice cream exactly. and the shakes and the yep. soda and all this stuff, and you really wouldn't fall into that camp of becoming overweight and, and obese. But today... You do the same things, and now it's a big problem. What happened? What changed? Same food, same person. Possibly, what's different? What's different is your hormone function. And we have to look at, instead of a calorie-based diet, a hormone-friendly based diet, how are these foods interacting with your hormones and also your microbiome, right? And so... And a lot of your hormones come from your microbiome. Exactly, exactly. That's what we really need to address because... 
folks could, again, be on the same diet as the next person, and one person can lose weight, one person can gain weight, you know, another person can stay the same. It's not just about the, the quality, I'm sorry, the, the, the quantity of the calories, it's the quality of those calories. How are they affecting your hormones and your microbiome? That's really the key. And sleep is very similar. And I share this example of like, it's very different when you eat 300 calories of broccoli versus 300 calories of ding-dongs, right? Which was, you know, the chocolate oh, covered yeah. cream. I lived know, on those that was as my, a heart surgery resident, just stay awake all night. I was about at least 7% ding-dong yeah. myself, yeah. you know, One like of my a whole probably half of my hand. Anyway, so here's the thing. <laughs> With sleep is very similar because you can get you know, eight hours of Twinkie sleep or ding dong sleep when you're really looking for that high quality, you know, broccoli sleep, right. as it were, you know, right. because it's the quali quality, not just the quantity. Quantity does matter, but the quality is going to affect you a whole lot. So same thing when it comes to food and sleep. So you've been doing this uh, now for, is this your sixth year of podcasts and everything? Yeah. I, so I've been in practice, so uh, in the health space for about 17 years. Yeah. Somewhere around there. You start losing count after a while. I but know. yeah, with the yeah. podcast, uh, it's been about getting close to six years now. So um, how do you deal with criticism through all of this? Got any tricks? Oh, man, that's such a great question. I just posted on Instagram the other day, at Sean Model, S-H-A-W-N, the right way, the right spell. No, I'm just kidding. No offense. But um, I just posted the other day to not get drunk off of praise and don't get drunk off of criticism either. I think you need to bring a very balanced perspective into this because today everybody is really a brand. You know, if you have a social media account, you're, you know, you're a brand in a sense. Right. And you're going to be judged automatically. People are constantly judging you. It's just the nature of the beast, but it's preventing so many people from sharing their gift because they're so worried about other people and their and their beliefs, you know, their criticism. And so for me, it's great when somebody says something beautiful about me or about something that I've done. I think it's awesome, but I just let, I let it go. I give thanks and I let it go. If any criticism comes up, I could check it out and let it go. You know, just don't let it destroy who I believe I am and my mission. And so I got to say this. If you don't have any critics, then you're probably not doing anything, you know? So you want to press to get some critics, to get some haters, you know? Um, but at the end of the day, I think that, and I've seen this evolution take place with myself, I don't see much of that. And I don't, partly because I don't pay it much attention, but also, you know, I'm very inclusive in what I do. You know, I'm not setting out to make other people wrong. I have my perspective and my experience, and that's what I've been sharing here. And I also back a lot of stuff up with peer-reviewed evidence. Yeah, exactly. You know? And digging through, I'm doing the work, you know, so we can argue about this all you want, but you're gonna look, no, I'm just kidding. I just want people to understand that, you know, we can have healthy conversation, right. you know, it, as long as stuff is done respectfully, that's what it's really all about. That's gonna help move us forward. And also I'm not tied to the fact that I'm right either, nah. you know, and that's a big secret, you know, so it doesn't hurt me as much if I, if I have my identity invested in that and you criticize it, that's gonna sting a little bit more, you know, but I don't have my identity tied to any one thing. I'm very open to change. And I think that's what uh, the best in the field do, you know, because everything is constantly changing. We know a fraction of the data out there about food. We right. barely know anything, you know, but we're learning. And to be open to that, I think is a huge key. Yeah, very good, very good. All right. Um... I guess I got to wrap it up. So, uh, as uh, as I've told you, we ask an audience question, and this will be fun. You, you're going to get to answer this too. Oh my okay. Goodness. All right. So the question comes in from Sylvie. I've been trying the recipes from your books, but some of the suggested ingredients can cause bloating and flatulence, such as cabbage, cauliflower, asparagus. You mentioned broccoli, and almond flour. Any tips on how to deal with this? So you have to, number one, realize that that bloating and flatulence comes from your gut buddies telling you how much you, they enjoy what you're giving them. And I want you to realize that in many parts of the world, farting at the dinner table is a sign of respect for <laughs> the chef. 
The other thing you'll come to find out, which is really true, is if you're feeding your gut buddies right, your farts don't stink. They really don't. So, you know, next time you're, you know, just let one go and say, oh, my gut buddies are so happy. I do that all the time. Sean, uh, any comebacks to that? I mean, how do oh. we get past this period? <laughs> the other thing, usually after a few weeks, this all calms down. Yeah. And if I can talk people, even with what they think is IBS, through this period of time where they definitely have cramps and bloating and they're farting a lot, it really calms down. Mm -hmm. uh, true, true. Thoughts? Yeah, when you're changing, making changes to your diet, I mean, you know, it's those microbes, you know, your, your gut buddies, they have a certain food that they're used to, and when you change things up, certain bacteria are gonna feel less welcomed. Others are gonna start celebrating and giving off gas, you know, maybe. Um, but one of the things that if you, you know, when we're kids, beans, beans, good for your heart, the more you eat, the more you fart. The issue with beans, so we've got like amylopectin B, right? And we don't really have the enzymes like in our mouth, like amylopectin A, we can break down bread, you know, sugar, uh, carbs in our mouth very right. quickly, um, but not, so for beans, we're feeding those bacteria, and it can set off a party. And so the same thing, how are you preparing them is going to affect it exactly. as well. So doing the soaking, doing the pressure cooking, eliminates so much of that. Like almost, like for most people, it's gone. Yeah. So it's how you're preparing these things can really help a lot. Yeah, if I can get people to get a, an Instant Pot or another pressure cooker, it makes such a difference. And it makes so it makes it so easy for families who, you know, are working three jobs and the kids are yeah. going to twenty seven sports and violin yeah. practices and and how do you get food on the table and, you know quickly that, that'll feed them properly is, yeah. is a big deal. And a and a pressure cooker will will it will kill lectins and it'll get the food on the table. Good food quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, how can, how can people find you? Um, you mentioned your podcast, yeah. and it's an amazing podcast, everybody. Uh, social media, where can we find you besides your podcast? Awesome. Yeah, so the podcast is called The Model Health Show. And I'm very grateful to say it's been the number one health podcast many, many times over these years. And um, it's just such a a passion project as well. It's one of the favorite things in my in my reality. So you don't have to be a model to go to the... Absolutely it, not. So it's not for models, <laughs> but models could probably use it. All right. It's one of the things that gets people in the door. You know, they see my icon, you know, which is, you know, you'll see it when you look at the show up, but then they find out it's a whole lot more. But, you know, you're also showing people, like, we have the results that you're looking for, but we cover every aspect of health. I'm very passionate about that. Um, you talk about relationship health. I think that our relationships are the biggest influence on our health and our success in life. And so we talk about that. And I'll have the very best folks on the planet to talk about, like John Gray, women are from Mars. I'm sorry, uh, men are from <laughs> women Mars. Are from Mars. <laughs> men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and we'll have him on there. And I also do masterclass episodes myself where you know we'll dive in and we'll talk about what are some tactics and also reverse engineer diabetes. Like what does that look like? Fascinating stuff that you can apply for your own life. Every person can get something of value from each episode. And also to help your friends and family in your community. You know, So we've got a lot of folks who are in the health space that listen to the show. So uh, definitely check that out. Again, the Model Health Show. And on social media, I'm at Sean Model, S-H-A-W-N-M-O-D-E-L. Mostly on Instagram now. I found um, a little bit of a love for that in the, in the recent year. I wasn't on social media. I was focused on the podcast for quite a quite a while and so people can find it there and you can pick up Sleep Smarter at any uh, bookstores, online, Amazon, all that good stuff as well. All right. Very good. Well, again, pleasure to see you again. Thank Thanks you. for coming on the show and I'll have to have you back again if you don't mind. Absolutely. Don't all right. Well, that's it for the Dr. Gundry podcast and we'll see you next time because I'm Dr. Gundry and I'm always looking out for you. <laughs> <laughs>